even if you see one on a cop's hip while he's not looking and you look at it and you, that that's a different feeling when it's like right within arm's grasp then i i don't have any guns so you know i guess come rob me <laughs> and i'm not saying it scares me or or makes me uncomfortable necessarily no one's no one's questioning your masculinity paul it does change my mood you don't keep one in your purse i understand <laughs> <laughs> Delta Delta 1400 Security. You are listening to Ground Radio. <coughs> oh, wow. We're even starting with a cough. Mm hmm. You sick, buddy? Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can still tell. I've been sick for the entire span of fall in, in Pennsylvania. Mm hmm. That only lasted like 12 days. Right. It really did. It went from 80 to 30 in a week and a half. Yeah, it was very frustrating because that is my favorite time of the year. We mentioned it before. And in the blink of an eye, it was over. And the one downside of it all that you feared was getting sick. And you did. And I got sick, too. And it went through the whole family. It rippled across, did the wave through my children and wife. I think my daughter got it and she shrugged it off. My wife got it. She was miserable for a day. I got it, but I'm just miserable. You need rest, man. You know, we, we talked about before, when does a guy go to the doctor? It's like, when it's bad enough, and it's never been bad enough. Because at this point, now when I go, I'm going to spend the money, I'm going to get the pills, and it's like, I could have been not miserable for two weeks now. Now it's like, I want to power through it just to prove that I could have powered through it. But do you find that when you go, the thing that they give you actually helps? Absolutely. Modern medicine's great. Okay. I think I got sick from the flu shot. Don't get... <laughs> don't get... It's not how it works, man. I know. It's not the actual shot. It's going to the doctor's office where they're sick people and being coughed on by strangers. I've been very good in my life to not expose myself to germs now as an adult with a child and having to go out in public i'm exposing myself to all these germs it sounds like there's a lot of rude people there that don't really understand how to cover their mouths are you afraid of germs would you say i don't like them i think fear is one of those things we throw around a whole bunch where i'm not afraid of them like irrationally but i'm not licking handrails yeah, but even if you touch a handrail, do you feel dirty? Do you feel like, ah, I don't want to... You know how like sometimes you got to hold your hands like away from your body because you're like, I, I got to get these washed sooner than later. You know, like after you pet a dog and it licks you and you're like, yeah. I'm the guy that opens the public restroom door with my elbow. Okay. Yeah, you're you're aware. Yeah. I had some training in the military about biological warfare and everything and ever since then I, I don't really go to the buffet let's just say that i get a little nervous around the public because of your military training wow that's interesting i i was trained in paranoia it happens <laughs> they spoiled buffets for the poor guy that's the worst that they've taken from me i guess it's a pretty good career i guess that's true you know what you gotta count your blessings but with fear there's the idea of this thing could potentially harm me yeah and then there's the, this thing triggers a response in me, even though there's no threat. The first one makes sense. Right. The second one is debilitating, I think was one of the words we were using last time. You literally can't function. You can't think clearly. You might hurt yourself and others involuntarily because you are so stricken with fear. Uh, I was even seeing that it's very common for people to have heart attacks when they are in the middle of one of their um, episodes. Yeah, like they turn the thing that cannot hurt them to where it actually can kill them. Yeah, <laughs> scared to death. So we just got through a holiday where we celebrate fear. Well, some people, I would say the majority of people. Oh, it's big. I don't even know if it's bigger now than it was, you know, maybe 20 years ago. And it's for adults. <laughs> That's the thing is it used to be like, oh, the kids are going to have fun for Halloween. But now everybody on my news feed is uh, taking part. I grasp onto Halloween because I've always loved it, especially from my childhood. But I do a fun Halloween because I never liked the sensation of being scared. 
I, I never got that concept. Okay. You're not a horror junkie? No. I like the fun part of Halloween. Mm-hmm. But we had a dude. He was like a few blocks away from us. He was chasing people with what I assume was a modified, made safe chainsaw. Okay. But it made noise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, you don't get away with that on a normal day. But when <laughs> Halloween's around, everything goes out the window. Okay. You can totally harass people and children and laugh about it. Well, he was on his property, right? Ah, uh, from my understanding, he made very liberal use of the entire block. Okay. <laughs> No, you're right. He would definitely have to speak to the cops about something for doing that on any other day. See, I like the Halloween because the cops are out. Like, we see cops all the time. They hand out candy. Oh, okay. But it's just the holiday where you throw out every lesson you teach a child just because it's a special day where we can break all the rules. Don't take candy from strangers. Don't go to a stranger's house. Don't chase people with chainsaws. Like, nope, not today. All those <laughs> things are okay. Huh. We're setting a bad example. Um, Do you call it mischief night? Is it the night before Halloween? I know you have a separate thing where you have a trick-or-treat, and that has to do with, like, the football, the high school football game. Long story short, our town does trick-or-treat the Thursday before Halloween. Mm-hmm. And that was because the junior high schools, there used to be two in our town, and they would play their football game that night. So it would distract the teenagers okay? so the little kids can enjoy the night. That's that in a nutshell. But what do you do if Halloween's actually on a Thursday? You just just do it. I know, but then the the little kids don't have as much fun. It's ruined for them. No, uh, actually, to make this even more ridiculous, uh, those junior highs merged like five years ago. So they don't even have that football game anymore. Oh, okay. You're just stuck in the tradition of it. That's one of those things where it was set into motion years ago, and now it's irrelevant, but we're still doing it. Okay, okay. But I've heard of Mischief Night. We never really had that in our town, which is strange, because my wife, being from Philadelphia, she spoke of Mischief Night in more reverence than she did Halloween. (laughs) And, And it's the day before? The Yeah, the night before, yes. The night night before, I should say. And I saw that there's a few different names for Mischief. I always called it Mischief Night. Um, I saw Hell Night is another one, and also Cabbage Night, which is certain parts of the country, um, and I think the UK, which is, so they just never changed it from whatever the UK used to do. Uh, Cabbage night, but this is hijinks night, and that's what I thought whoa, you were getting. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're just going to gloss over the fact it's called cabbage night? What they used to do was try to put a head of cabbage in your chimney, and it wouldn't be apparent that you got tricked until, like, I don't know, a couple of weeks later when it rotted in there, and I think it would stink up the whole house and block your chimney. That was the prank. They didn't have toilet paper. I don't think they used to throw eggs all willy-nilly, so they had cabbage to spare. Sounds like a ploy by Big Cabbage to get more cabbage sales. Maybe. I'm calling a cabbage night from now on, and I don't care if anyone understands why. Did you ever do any pranks when you were a kid? I never I never was brave enough to do like an actual Halloween prank like that. No. I was a good kid. I was terrified of any type of repercussion. Yeah. And I just sat in fear. (laughs) I wasn't beaten as a child or anything. It was just I was a terrified of authority. So I lived a very uninteresting childhood. Did your house ever get trashed? No. We we lived just off main roads. Maybe that was the thing. Maybe I never had that vengeful... Well, you guys got me. I'm going to try to get you situation. Right. No, I lived in a place where the houses are too spread apart to even really effectively trick or treat. But my cousins, they got their house uh, egged. And I remember my uncle had them like he woke up in the morning. He's like, oh, we got egg last night. Get outside. Hose it off. (laughs) It's like, oh, man, they got an extra chore the day after Halloween. How fun. Yeah, you get to eat candy the night before, and then the next day you wake up to do egg cleaning and toilet paper. With your candy hangover. Ugh. I don't know. I never liked scaring people, and I never liked trashing things. So I maybe I wasn't good at Halloween. I don't know. 
there is a um official Halloween phobia too. Cuz it's not Halloweenophobia. No, that doesn't sound v- very clever. Samhainophobia. I'm going to say that's how it's pronounced. I could be wrong. Okay. Is this based off of Halloween is a pagan celebration and the actual thing that's taking place on Halloween, not what we've turned it into, uh-huh. is what they're afraid of? Yeah. Yeah, they're not afraid of jack-o'-lanterns and uh, you know fake spiders and spider webs, but... Fun-sized candy bars don't strike fear in their heart. They're actually thinking that... Um... The underworld is coming. Is that what it is? The the underworld is coming up for an evening. They get like a free reign to go around and haunt the place. The veil between the spirit world and our world is at its thinnest. So you're able to see into it or experience it or they can influence each other on that night. Oh, I like that. But the idea of trick or treat came from mischief night. Basically, Mischief Night was first. Kids were causing problems in, I believe, Kansas. And Hmm. one of the residents decided to organize a thing to keep kids occupied that night. Yeah. And she suggested that they dress up and they have a parade. And that parade turned into people giving them candy and keeping them interested so they weren't, I don't know, setting fires to fields or whatever you do in Kansas when you're bored. Yeah. You would know better than I. (laughs) So... Unfortunately, the idea of trick or treat spawned from how to keep kids occupied. And even to this day, I kind of use it as a gauge of how to kiss their butt a little bit. Yeah, because if you're the house that gives out some good stuff, you get left alone. Mm -hmm. They got your back. I can see where the pagan holiday turned into this mischief night thing. And now this mischief night thing turned into this trick or treat thing. And. It's nowhere near its beginnings, but just cause and effect have led it to be where it is today. And then in the end of it all, you get to see your normally conservative co-worker's cleavage because she's going to show off for that one day. She can get away with that kind of lifestyle for a day. Yeah, low-cut shirts mean you're a cat as long as you have cat ears. That's right. That's all you need is a headband. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, We're good. Everyone loves it. Okay, so Halloween's the day that we celebrate fear. It is more of a celebration than a fearful experience. And I'm like you. I, I don't get into horror films. I like I don't like that jump feeling when the when the guy closes the mirror and there's someone behind him. That doesn't I'm not glad I experienced that startling feeling. I don't do well with haunted houses. I have the fight reflex. Okay. <laughs> and my problem is I don't want to punch a boy scout in the face because he like jumped up behind me. And I, I know it's just a kid, it's just a joke. But my body triggers to, like, start swinging, mm-hmm. and I don't want to punch a kid. What do you think? Somebody's going to pick your pocket? I don't know what I think. I know that I almost punched an ex-girlfriend at a movie theater because there was a jump scare, and she grabbed my arm, and I almost swung at her. Like, that's something I really got to work on. Yeah, wow. But that's why I don't go into haunted houses. Like, haunted hay rides are great because there's open space, and I don't feel the urge to punch people. Mm-hmm. But, like, if I'm enclosed, I'm a caged animal, dude. Like, I don't think it'd be a very good punch. It would probably be more of a flail and a scream. Still, I don't want any part of it. Absolutely not. No, no, no one wants a, a lip wristed swinging <laughs> punch in the nose. Nobody wants that. An accidental elbow to the temple. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll probably hurt three people around me instead of the person that scared me, but still. Make sure you trim your fingernails. <laughs> But yeah, we we were really actually hoping to get into legitimate phobias, uh, ultimately, instead of just Halloween, which just passed, and we all enjoyed, right? I did. You won the hearts of your entire town. I'm king again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know. The guy with the chainsaw was pretty popular. Okay. Uh, Do you have a, a phobia of people with chainsaws? I would say that I would be pretty helplessly debilitated if someone came after me with a chainsaw. I I wouldn't possibly be able to think straight or know what to do. It's wrong, but I I just... Because I didn't get to see him because we were locked down. We were doing our thing, but I just assumed he was dressed as a clown. Yeah. That seems to be the go-to for fear now. Well, the thing that makes clowns scary is that they're hidden in plain sight. Well, you mean you can't see their actual human faces? Because it's painted? Yes. They become anonymous, and it's a threat. 
my kids were scared when we were waiting in line to go in. We went to the circus anyway, but when we were waiting in line, the clowns were outside. They were giving those clowns some hard side eye. And I was like, you know what? Good instincts. I support your stance on this. I wouldn't want you to just approach this guy either. Well, something must have changed because it's not like clowns have always been this symbol of fear. Right. And uh, to throw the official word around, I think it's chlorophobia. Yes. But I'm just going to say fear of clowns. There had to have been a switch somewhere. And I think that it's not fair to say most people have chlorophobia, that they're terrified of clowns. Because 95% of the time when I see a clown now, yeah, it's intentionally meant to be menacing. Like, I'm not seeing the funny ones anymore. I'm seeing the horrifying ones. So they got bad PR for a few years, and now it's over. Yeah, I mean, like Stephen King's It, or the hundreds of B-movies involving a clown killer, uh, John Wayne Gacy. Like, all those things, you should be scared of those things, because they are scary. But Noodles the Clown from the parade, Mm -hmm. he's just a dude trying to make kids laugh, and he just can't do that anymore because of all these horribly demented people that are close enough to what he does, but completely the different intent. Clowns are at the bottom of the barrel of the performing industry, I would say. So, Are you talking about rodeo clowns? <sighs> You've been watching Baskets, too? Yeah, it was there. I'm sorry. I love Baskets. <laughs> There's a great example of an unsuccessful clown. But yeah, I mean, you, you don't think like, oh, he's a clown. Man, I'd want his life. Or <laughs> oh, he, he does birthday parties. <laughs> he gets a lot of work. The captain of industry he is. Maybe that's part of the problem is we're we're getting a lot of uh, people who are down on their luck being clowns. So that's not going to propagate a good reputation. I mean, as far as clowns go, you have Ronald McDonald, Sad Hobo Clown, and Murder Clown. None of them give a positive light on anything. No. And Ronald McDonald's is scary looking. He's <laughs> he's a scary looking thing. I sort of agree with you, but I think we made this scary to ourselves. Like... The thing that I think is scary about a clown is you're right. They are semi-anonymous. They have the makeup on. Their clothes are distracting. Yeah. That's how you rob a bank, okay? Dressed as a clown. (laughs) Yes. But the other thing, like, I feel is there's this trust thing that is now gone. Years ago, I would imagine that if someone saw a clown, they'd be like, oh, he's here to make me laugh. He's here for fun. Okay. It's only, it's going to make a balloon animal and it's going to be great. Yeah. And now it's like, he may have a machete. There's a trust thing that's just (laughs) gone now. Yeah. And that makes you almost a little more vulnerable to him because you just can't trust him. You know, I'm not even close to being a clownophobe, which is what I'll just call it because I don't have it written down either. (laughs) But now, now I'm starting to feel bad. I'm starting to feel bad to what happened to the clowns. I work with guys that are clowns. Yeah. And they say it stinks because they can't be clowns. Like they, they enjoy it and everyone has their thing. I'm definitely not going to judge because I, you know, I'm a stormtrooper. Yeah. But they say it's they can't book gigs and they have to approach kids way more different. Whereas 10 years ago, they could just walk up fairly easily to a kid. And, but now they said they're, they're met with more shrieks than anything. And they, no, they don't want to scare kids. That's not their intent at all. Right. So your clown friends are seasoned clowns. They've been doing it for a decade or more. Yes. I I see. I don't think that you have a lot of unseasoned clowns at this point because people aren't becoming clowns. Yeah, there's no new clowns. Yeah, we're Mm. stuck with the same old clowns. (laughs) We're we're running out of clowns. The last generation. But no one minds. Everyone's happy we're running out of clowns. It's a dying art. Yeah. We could basically blame Stephen King for all this. He ruined clowns in the state of Maine. (laughs) That son of a bitch. (laughs) I don't mind um, dolls so much or puppets. People have doll collections and a lot of people would find that creepy if they saw like someone's big doll collection on display. Uh, And I get it. It's like a lot of eyes looking at you. You almost feel like you're being watched. But what I find the most creepy is the dummies, either the ones that the ventriloquist use with just the mouth moves or even the ones that are in like the crash tests with the no face. Those really? are really creepy too. I think the dummies, 
uh, creepier than clowns to me is those ventriloquist dummies and those faceless dummies. You could be afraid of the whole uncanny valley thing where they're close enough to humans where it's unsettling to you. Okay, right. I could also imagine walking into a room with hundreds of dolls and I could see (laughs) being uncomfortable about the person who owned them. Right. Whoever decided to put so much effort into this particular thing has a problem. Yeah. I mean, maybe they just like dolls. There's nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't mean that my brain's not going to go. Or maybe they like to wear human skin. Like, (laughs) you don't know. (laughs) That's a big leap. It is. (laughs) Crash test dummies, though. I feel empathy for them. Like, I feel bad for them. No, I, I'm not saying they're scary when they're getting smashed up, but if there was like a, a dummy sitting in my chair, like with that no face and like the target on his chest or whatever, it just looks a little, I don't know. There's just something about it. Yeah, I think that may be Uncanny Valley thing. Yeah. That's kind of scary, but I, I'm pretty sure in your mind, you're just like, it's just, it's going to move. Like at one point it's yeah. going to move and then how do you beat it? Because you can't yeah. poke it in the eyes. and <laughs> Yes, it has no emotions. I can't understand it. Yeah. It probably doesn't understand me. Yeah. At least with the doll, I can sympathize and say, oh, it's it's got hair, yeah. just like a person. You're tiny, but I mean, even the life-size <laughs> crash test dummies, you're like, this thing's like six foot tall. <laughs> yeah, I could see that being uncomfortable. Maybe I'm just thinking of, uh, you know, that shape-shifting Terminator thing. There's some Doctor Who stuff, too. I mean, there, there's a... I think they had a mannequin thing. I, tr- I tried. I, I didn't get into the Doctor Who. I never saw it. I, I do respect a lot of people that watch it, though. Like, I think there are people who I see posts about it, and I think that they have good taste. So I'm assuming that it must be a pretty good show. But it seems like a big investment. Yeah, it is a big investment, and I think the fans are good-natured. They always seem yeah. to be a uh, good fan base. Likeable. Not like the damn Rick and Morty fans screwing it up for everybody with their stupid sauce. But maybe you're just not smart enough to understand them, Paul. No, I love Rick and Morty. I don't like the fans. No, you're just not smart enough to understand them. I'm embarrassed to say that I'm a Rick and Morty fan in in mixed company. It's a great show and a toxic fandom. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Fear of Szechuan sauce. Oh, that's how you pronounce it. See, I was—I didn't know how to say it, so. Well, didn't you watch the show? I did. I, I, I just didn't remember how to pronounce it still. Okay. It's okay. Move on. <laughs> I think you can get over phobias. Yeah. I, I mean, me as, as a non-professional therapist, you know, rub some dirt on it, power through, you can get through phobias just fine. Mm-hmm. Thanks to Maury. He's helping everybody. Just kind of put it in their face and shove cameras all around them. The best way to get over a fear is to just submerge yourself in it. They'll be better after the commercial break. You'll see, folks. I'm a hero. (laughs) They'll either be cured or dead. Either way, they're not afraid of that balloon anymore. And I can't believe I saw this one guy and he was scared of peaches. And this dude was well over six feet, and like he was a big guy. And they chased him all over the stage. He ran through the crowd. He was like trying to squeeze through, you know, like when you're going to the movies and you got your popcorn. And finally, yeah, he ends up in the fetal position on the floor because they have pictures of peaches and real peaches. And then this one sadistic guy is squeezing the peach open right no. over him. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Everyone knows people who are afraid of peaches hate the <laughs> insides the most. They don't want to see the flesh. No. I thought it was a rubber peach, but now you're proving that it's real. They must have had have had to have him sign something that said, like, hey, if I have a heart attack, it's not on Maury. Uh, I think they had him sign something saying that, hey, I know you're not afraid of peaches, but can you non-disclosure <laughs> agreement? Oh, man, you're pulling back the curtain on Maury? Uh... Oh, next thing you're going to tell me that Hulk Hogan wasn't really fighting. <laughs> like I said, there's the... Fears of things that can kill you. That's justified. The rational ones, yeah. The irrational ones, I can't put myself in everyone's shoes, but I'm sure something traumatic can happen to you, and you'd be afraid of a thing that is generally nothing to be afraid of. Well, even if you have a phobia of things that are bad, you still want to overcome it. Like, let's say, a phobia for fire. Okay. Um, You want to be able to think straight. You want to 
have a respect for fire, but not a fear of it. You want to be able to say, okay, now I, what's the next steps I have to take? I need to get my family together. I need to make phone call. I need to, you know, there's a procedure. And if you're phobic, you're not going to be capable of making a responsible choice in these actual situations. My wife, she uh, had a fear of needles. Had. Love it. Yeah. This is why I say you can just buckle down and get through it. She was a mess whenever she would have to go get needles. She's not a weak woman. She's not weak willed. She's pretty tough. She had a baby. She's a tough chick, but she had this fear of needles to the point to where in the dentist, she'd be screaming whenever they were putting it in her mouth and uh, not getting flu shots or anything like that. Yeah. The story goes that you were in the waiting room waiting for her to get something done real fast. And you thought that there was a poor child back there screaming and you asked her if she heard it, and she said it was her. Yeah, and I saw that she's just terrified. Even when our dog would go get shots, she couldn't be in the room. Like, she just was terrified of hmm. needles. Even though the needle wasn't even meant for her. Correct. Wow. But through childbirth and having to just be there to get the shots for the sake of the child, she has overcome it. Yeah. But the hardest thing to explain to her was, it's okay to be a little afraid of it, just not as afraid as you are. Like, that's not a fair thing to say to anyone. Mm -hmm. But you should be afraid of sharp objects coming at you. Yeah. That's a rational fear. Should you melt down and scream? No, not really. To say, don't be scared, is not even validating them at all. Or, or to say, it's no big deal. It is a uncomfortable situation but you still have to be able to like compose yourself too that's like going up to someone with depression and saying just try not to be sad yeah put a smile on your face anyway there's nothing you can do to fix that psychology except for just kind of be supportive right and she got a tattoo which surprised everybody around because of her fear and i think it helped her get over it yeah but even then i was like well, that's not like really like a shot I was having a hard time wrapping my head around. It's just sharp, pointy things, not needles, not, you know, because a tattoo, it's almost, it feels like a scrape and it's more of a mm -hmm. very, 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 very tiny. It's not like it's an injection. It's not going deep. Yeah. So it's not fair for us to say people with this phobia, they just need to get over it. But I believe it's possible for a lot of people to get over their irrational fears by putting themselves in a better state of mind. Yeah. Learning more about it. Avoiding it all the time, you're never going to get comfortable around it. That's going to perpetuate it. Mm -hmm. In the modern times that we live in now, we have the option to get exposure therapy through virtual reality, you know, instead of just playing games with it. For example, someone who might be afraid of large crowds would go into a virtual reality where they could control the amount of people walking by until eventually they don't flip out and they increase the density of the uh, crowd until the person can do it in real life. So it's kind of cool that they're using it for that, I thought. So that's more of like building up a mental immunity. I guess that's what exposure would be. Yeah, I would like to see that happen because I am I'm not a fan of crowds in closed spaces like I, I mentioned earlier. I would say I have an aversion to it. Mm -hmm. If the person is able to control how many people they're seeing through virtual reality, then they would get used to it. I guess the next step would be to not be the one that's in control. So you can't just turn it off. And then after a while, eventually it's OK. This isn't, I guess, a big deal. I, I, I like the concept. It's pretty clever doing it through VR. I didn't see if the person was in control. I think control would have to have the biggest part of it. Because being able to just have control of it, then all of a sudden when you're in that real situation, you don't have control of it. That would be the experience, giving up that control. I did get the impression that they were in a controlled environment, not that they were home with their own get over large crowds CD in, or whatever CD. Come on, Grandpa. There's no CDs. It's, it's either a 199 app. Or it's an app with ads on it. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. There's a McDonald's and a... Crowd simulator. <laughs> There's just banners everywhere. Well, you know, I'm going to throw a little stats at you because that's what I like to do. 
it's less than 10% of people in the U.S. are officially uh, diagnosed with phobias. Now, obviously, there's unreported cases, too. But when I heard less than 10%, I thought, like, no way. It's It's got to be higher than that. So many people are, you know, even like spiders. We've all had at least, you know, a girlfriend or two that they have to leave the bathroom with, <laughs> with their pants around their ankles because there was a spider in there. And you have to take care of it. There's no way they're going to go back in there. Like, like they'll go down the street to the Starbucks to piss <laughs> before they go back in that bathroom. I was at my ex-girlfriend's house, and there was a big fat spider it was really weird it was large and it was like walking <laughs> strangely yeah it had a scar and a tattoo and it was smoking a cigar <laughs> yes they were freaking out and i was freaking out too because it was like all weird i was younger much much younger <laughs> at the time and there was like a empty cube of you know like pepsi cubes like the 24 can oh, thing yeah yeah i tossed that on top of it and then i stepped on it because i didn't have shoes on uh-huh. and then i stepped on the box okay thinking that should have been enough there's the barrier dude it was fat and wobbling because it was about to have babies oh. or whatever they do like it, it was on them or whatever the situation is because i don't think they give live birth the spider was actually a thousand tiny spiders when i picked that box up the spider just expanded all over the place. Yeah. Oh, man. That is how you gain a phobia. Yeah. And it took me a long time to get over that. I still think about this day. But now I'm a spider relocator. Oh. I will relocate the spiders to the front of my house outside to collect all the bugs in my garden mm-hmm. out there. So They're on our side. They are. Yeah. Spiders and snakes are the top two, by the way. I don't know if you realize that. Makes sense. Even after fire and death and cancer and getting old. But a lot of people say they have a phobia, but what they really have, you know, the definition is an aversion. They're, they wouldn't be diagnosed as a, a phobia. Like you said, you know, needles aren't pleasant. Spiders aren't pleasant. I mean, you'll see a freak or two having like a tarantula crawl around on them and enjoy it. Yeah, weirdos. But for the most part, it makes everyone uncomfortable. Yeah, when I say I'm a spider relocator, I mean, it's usually through like a paper towel or something. Like, I never touch the thing. Even if I've already killed it and it can't even spread its legs out anymore, and it's a little ball, I'm still going to use one square to relocate it into the toilet. I am also a friend of the bees. That would be... The honeybee. Yeah, the honeybee. But... I'm a friend of the bees in the way of maybe keyboard activists. I I say I won't kill bees. And then when I'm outside, I will go to war with them because I am terrified and I don't know which ones are honeybees. And it's just if it's flying in yellow and black, I'm going to squish it. Yeah, what am I, a scientist, an anthropologist? To me, they're winged demons, all of them. And I think the one that we really need to save, like, won't harm you, but I don't care anymore because the evil wasps have put on sheep's clothing and now I'm just afraid of all sheep. (laughs) I try to cohabitate, but it doesn't work. Yeah. See, that's why spiders don't make me jump as much as the flying bugs, because the flying bugs can, like, get you in the face and stuff. You know, that spider's going to crawl up my leg and bite me. Good luck, man. Spiders, you got to go through the shoe. You have to get under the pants. It's going to be an effort for you. (laughs) B, you're in my eye if you want to be. They have the tactical advantage. They do. They look evil. Evil was a great word. When they fly around, they just look like they're up to no good. When you're fighting a crawling insect, it's a two-dimensional battle. Mm -hmm. They can go back and forth, left and right. A B is a three-dimensional battle. They're running on the X, Y, and Z axis. Like, yeah. If you swing, like you have a higher chance of missing. That's true. That's what it is. So you really got to be on your game. And if you don't connect with that first one, you got to be on defense. Yeah. But really, the thing has probably no idea what's going on. I would think so. I do get the impression that if I'm not threatening the hive and I swat a bee away... That bee will give up and be like, oh, I didn't like that. He's not going to take it personal and be like, I got to find this guy and, and get back at him for that swat. I think we like give them superpowers. Like they can smell our fear pheromones. Yeah. <laughs> back at the hive, there's like a human anatomy diagram up there. And there's a general up there with his hat and his riding crop. Pointing to the eye and the ear. <laughs> yes. 
Get right by the ear. <laughs> when they go by the ear, they will crumble in fear because of our loud buzzing. That's how you disable the human. That's it. It's simple. Simple. They don't know our weak points. They don't know anything. Um, And then I saw that there are at least, because, you know, when they, they have a nice round number, you know that it's not accurate. There's at least 400 <laughs> distinct different kinds of phobias. And I saw that there is another sign of the times. A new phobia has emerged called nomophobia, which is being afraid of not having your phone or your phone not having service, being cut off from your uh, mobile device. I not only experience it a little bit, I have seen some people get very uncomfortable when their battery is like at 20%. Yeah, yeah. And when I'm at work, I try not to have my phone on me. And sometimes I'll just throw it in my locker. Okay. And after a while, I get antsy because I don't know what time it is because I don't have a watch because I always use my phone. Like We become so dependent on them. Right. That I can see that being a real fear because, you know, 25, 30 years ago, if somebody needed to contact you, they would have to use their landline to call your work landline and maybe somebody would get to you eventually. You'd get a message for sure. It wouldn't be instant graphication like it is now. No, now it is the second something happens, you can get four or five different ways of getting this message to somebody. Yeah. But they all funnel through that phone. So you're cut off. You're literally cut off from everything you know and love. <laughs> but we have the addiction of being connected to, not like the how am I going to survive not being connected. Yeah. We've been doing that for thousands of years sure that's the only life we used to know so this sounds more like a withdrawal than a yeah it's an anxiousness because you're not connected and i go through it too i go through it i get antsy without my phone if i'm gonna have downtime i can go six hours without oh i wonder if my sister called i wonder if uh trump said anything stupid on twitter but ultimately i just don't want to be bored so if I'm going to have downtime, that's when I, I'm like, oh, where's my phone? Oh, I want to have enough battery. Because we grew up without technology dependency. I didn't have a PC in my house even until, uh, well, basically until I moved out. My parents got a good one. We had like uh, one that wasn't connected to the internet when I was in high school just so I could do <laughs> word, f word work for school. But when I think back, like, what did I used to do with my downtime? And obviously, like, in a waiting room, I would have grabbed for the magazine. Where now I never ever touch the magazine and in the bathroom on the toilet what did i grab the shampoo bottle and read that about 50 yep. times yep uh, and at breakfast i would read the cereal box so like i was already being mindless in the first place but now i get to control my mindlessness a little bit better and i love it i hate the generation identifiers the millennials the uh baby boomers and Gen the Xers. generation Xers. Yeah. yeah i hate that because people want to grasp onto that and group everyone in. Yeah. It seems like you'd be more impacted by the way you grew up. And the concept of these generations is you grew up like this. So these are the things that shaped you. And you and I are at the very beginning of the millennials by these definitions. Right. We're the oldest millennials. Yeah. And I saw it broken down to where we're called Xenials. Uh-huh. Computer technology affected us growing up, but it was in the later years, like our teenage years. Yes. So, yeah, we, we do the email, the Facebook, and all that stuff, but we didn't grow up on it. Right. I think that's also a way of a bunch of people that weren't Gen Xers be like, well, I'm not a millennial because that's what everyone wants to complain about right now. Because <laughs> millennials are the cause of everything bad right, happening right now. Yeah, until millennials are 40 years old, then the alphas are going to be the problem for everything, the generation alphas. Did they already decide the name of what comes next, or did you just say that? No, the generation alphas, also known as the glass generation, because they have grown up with one piece of glass or another in front of their face, be it their iPhone, tablet, all that stuff. Okay, so when does that start? 2007, when the iPhone came out? Uh, I think it's actually even more recently, like 2013 or 14. Interesting. New era. But like I said, those lines, to me, they don't mean much. But there is a concept there. Like, yeah, 
we were shaped by 9-11 and the economy. Yeah. That changed us in a way that didn't affect our parents. Mm -hmm. So we have problems that older generations don't have because we have these connections we've always had. And when they're severed by a dead phone, a lot of people might not know how to cope with that very well. So you're saying that we're at an advantage because we know both worlds? Is that what Yeah. They don't mm -hmm. know that in dire situations you can read a shampoo bottle while you're on the toilet. <laughs> so they just commence freak out mode. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. They also don't realize that you can write on the stalls of a public bathroom. <laughs> like, if you look, they're really clean now because people are always on their phone. I don't learn any new racial slurs while I'm in a bathroom, a public bathroom anymore. It's a shame. The janitors have less repainting to do. They used to have to do that every three months, but now they can go a full year before they repaint the bathroom. And the new janitors don't even care because they're just too busy screwing around on their phone. <laughs> the whole phobia thing to me seems like a first world problem situation. The spiders and snakes have been around. This, the fear of them has been around since the beginning of time, I understand, but or the beginning of humans anyway. Being afraid of a poisonous snake is a normal, rational fear. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, but you still want to be able to think straight enough to know which direction to run. I saw that there was two colors that are, people are scared of. I didn't see any others. I only saw the two colors of yellow and purple, and I was wondering what it was about those colors. And I know you're into color theory, so I thought maybe you might have a... A yellow would be cautionary. Right. Just through animals who are poisonous generally are brightly colored, and yellow being a common one. Mm -hmm. We use yellow as caution tape. It is a color that stands out, and generally it shows danger. There are studies that show that they can pass a fear from one generation to the other. Even if the new generation wasn't exposed to that or harmed by that thing, they can still get it passed to them. Do you think that's the situation with yellow? I think it's one of those... The guy who was coming up with caution tape or just safety codes, yeah, yellow rang with them. And I think it rang mm -hmm. with them because of some evolutionary traits. And I know that that kind of sounds crazy, but you ever look at something, you're like, yep, that's the perfect thing for that. Sure. Right, right. That's eliciting a response. I'm paying attention to that. You can say, well, it's a bright color, mm -hmm. but the reason why it triggers something in your mind is because there's something I believe deep seated. You can argue that a gray or a green traffic cone is probably a bad idea. <laughs> a gray traffic cone, I love it. I need to Photoshop that as soon as we're done here. <laughs> but I believe that there's something in you that says yellow, be aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Purple, no idea. Purple is the opposite of yellow, though, on the color wheel. So I was wondering if maybe their eyes are just wired incorrectly or something. I believe purple would also be another signaler. Uh, I keep thinking of the dart frogs because I always love dart frogs. I think they're really cool looking. And I believe purple is a poisonous dart frog. Poisonous like you get trippy when you uh, interact with it or you just die? It's not the good kind of poisonous. I think poisonous like it will kill a, a small mammal, maybe not a human. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a couple poisonous flowers that are purple. Okay. But I'm sure every color can be represented by a poison. But I, I just saying, when I looked through, I didn't see any other colors except those two. And I saw them both come up multiple times, but not any other colors at all. I remember in our previous Fears recording, we were talking about agoraphobia and how, how bizarre that is. Nobody wants to leave the house. And you're like, I don't know anybody like that. What I found out, because I decided to look into it. I'm like, why don't these people want to leave the house? What it usually traces back to with agoraphobics is they had a panic attack while they were out once before, and they don't know when the next panic attack may come, so they just don't want to leave the house because it's very embarrassing, obviously, to, you know, if you're out in public and you break down like that, and maybe even they call the ambulance or whatever for you. It's just so they just avoid leaving the house altogether. And I was like, oh, that's totally understandable. Like, at first, I'm like, what is this person antisocial? What's the deeper story? But it's really just a normal social thing. They don't want to embarrass themselves. I've been very fortunate that I've never had a panic attack. Uh -huh, me too. I have witnessed a few of them. And, man, I would just imagine in a public setting, either people would be running away from you or swarming toward you to see if they could help. 
both of those things are probably going to exacerbate it. Yeah, right. Good point. The only thing that you as maybe like the friend can do would be like, quick, go to a corner and hide and I'll keep people away from you. Which if you're in a situation to where you're a male and you tell a woman to go in the corner because she's crying or freaking out and anybody coming over to help, you're like, no, no, don't worry about it. (laughs) Boy, does that put you on a list. But I can see that you would feel more helpless. Yeah. Out in public. You more exposed, especially if you had it out in public, you might think that the trigger was public. Mm -hmm. So I feel terrible for those people because being afraid to enjoy the world would be horrible to me. But I guess if you're having panic attacks out there, you're not really enjoying it. No. And I I saw this one um, because there was the balloons, which is just people afraid of popping of balloons that's all they're really afraid of for the most part they're not actually afraid of balloons they just there's an anxiety in the room because there's a blown up balloon that could pop at any unpredictable time and i saw that there was a fear of buttons and i said well i have to look into this literally like the buttons on your clothes and this is by the way a great way to get out of going to weddings because you basically can just say, hey, you know, I got this irrational fear of buttons. I can't wear anything formal, like, ever, or even be around it. Uh, just just a quick question. Is there going to be buttons in the room? Because yeah. I will not be able to attend. Not one button. Not a single button. So I look I look into this button thing, and uh, the, the theories were in a couple of different places. One was like, you might have been abused by somebody who wore buttons. That's a stretch. You might have gotten caught in a shirt that had buttons and you couldn't get out of it, you know, as a, as a child. Those are literally the easiest shirts to get out of. Because <laughs> you could just tear the buttons off and let them spring yeah. around the room. Velcro maybe would be slightly better, but that's not a realistic shirt. Oh, yeah. The most plausible theory behind the fear of buttons is it's related to trypophobia, which is the fear of holes. And when I say the fear of holes, I don't mean like a hole in the ground. I'm talking about like those little holes, like in a hot, like a beehive. And like, if you see that, you know, that picture of that person's skin where they kind of Photoshop like some kind of weird flower and it looks like they got some kind of horrible rash. Okay. Yeah. That's what the fear of holes is. All those things you mentioned right there did make me uncomfortable though. So like, yeah, fair enough. Okay. And you know how like, posting popping blackheads is like taken over facebook by storm this is like our primal stuff coming out if if somebody's got holes in their skin or there's like a satisfaction to having clean skin i think it is and when the skin is not clean some people are like over the top uncomfortable about this it's like a purification type deal yeah they're just basically afraid of the fact that disease will probably spread or somebody's rotting from the inside out (sighs) That one, I think, is also a, could be considered a genetic one. You know what? You have to be on to something with this whole first world phobia thing. <laughs> yeah. I guess whenever survival is just a given, yeah, you have to find things to occupy your mind. Thank you. I wonder if I would have dated somebody from a third world country if they would have been interested in popping pimples. <laughs> I just want to swat them away because they keep poking at me. Or they're just, thank God that (laughs) there's not going to be a lion that's going to eat them tonight. Right. I spoil you, baby. Here's shelter. Skin care is much lower on the priority list. Don't worry, honey. You can drink the water. You won't get dysentery. (laughs) I know how to show a girl a good time. And I saw that there was a fear of gaining weight, which makes sense. A lot of people have eating disorders because of that kind of fear. But conversely, I did not see a fear of going to the gym, which I possibly have. I think that's just a fear of exercise. Yeah, okay. But being in a gym in itself is just looking around and feeling like I don't belong here. Oh, you know what, though? People are sweaty and gross. Yeah. Um, Planet Fitness is purple and yellow. There's a lot of reasons. We might add fear of going to the gym. Treadmills? Yeah. Treadmills. Uh, all right, man. That's all I got. Okay. I think I, I got everything out of, off of my chest. Nice. All right. I hope I feel better next time. Yeah. I'll be buried under about a foot and a half of snow probably next time we speak. 
not because it's going to be a well, but because <laughs> oh yeah, it's probably going to be seven degrees tomorrow. So that's the way the weather is trending. Holidays coming up. We're going to be talking about November. Maybe that's why people like Halloween so much. Is it's like the kickoff to the holiday season. You go through like a long summer drought where it's vacations and stuff, but right, Halloween's like hey, for the next three months, you got big events at the end of every month. Halloween's the top of the roller coaster before you start going down and end off the year. Yeah, and then you're just miserable in January. You're thanking God that the only thing you have to look forward to is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. That That's a big <laughs> one. Get your minority friend something nice. But uh, until uh, next time, I enjoy talking. Yes, it's been a pleasure, Z. Uh, we'll talk soon. <laughs>